Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining me once again today. I do really appreciate having your company. As you walk around, out and about, like I do a lot these days, you, you see different things and certain things uh, become uh, repetitive. You notice human behaviour and things that uh, happen. And uh, one of the things that came to my mind is signs. You know, there are signs all around us, um, street signs and traffic signs and advertising signs and there's everything, you know. Anyway, do people really pay attention to signs? Well, I don't think they do much these days, to be honest. I think we're surrounded by so many signs that uh, we don't really pay a great deal of attention to what the signs are. Quite often we look at something and we walk right past it because there's just signs everywhere. But look, if you're out in a country road and you're travelling for miles and miles and suddenly you come across a sign, bang, it really jumps out at you. But in the city, because you're surrounded by signs and letters and words everywhere, people don't pay much attention, sadly. And, well, as human beings, signs are important. We need to be told if there's danger ahead. We need to be told the speed limit. We need to be told if something's, uh, you know, it needs to be diverted. Um, we, you know, we need to know all these things. We need to know signs. We need to know the numbers of places so we visit the right place. <laughs> anyway, I can remember quite some time ago going to a, a restaurant that had been organised and uh, there were two restaurants with similar names and, and they were you know, a couple of kilometres apart but people ended up at both. <laughs> it can happen because you're not paying attention to the signs. But people, are, I guess what I want to talk about today is people who, who don't pay attention to very serious signs. And anyone who, who travels around in a car these days would know that um, if you sit on the speed limit 70% of people are going to go past you. Um, because a speed limit sign doesn't mean anything anymore to people. Um, and we have stop signs, we have give way signs, and we have roundabouts where you're meant to give way to a person already within the roundabout, or the second rule, but give way to the right. Look, well, depending on what country you're in, I suppose. But look, the rules are there to, to be obeyed. But what has actually happened in our Western society is we set up a, a democratic system that would help people and keep, I guess, organisation in society. But because the Western society is being broken down and battered by people all over the place. We've got people who think that those signs are just there for others. It's not there for them. And you see, that's why I say 70% of people are not paying any attention to the speed limit whatsoever. And in, in Australia, and I'm sure there are other places in the world, when you're approaching a school, okay, the, 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 the speed limit has to go down. In, in Australia, it drops down 20 or 30 uh, uh, kilometres per hour as you approach the school zone and go past the school. But people don't pay attention to that. I'm telling you, half the people just go through there at whatever speed they feel like going through there. And then what happens, of course, is we've got speed cameras, we've got police on motorbikes, police in cars, we've got all kinds of things that go on and people get fined. And the revenue from people not obeying signs is massive, absolutely massive. People in, in our Western society, because uh, we have this uh, freedom idea, think that they're free to do anything and our, our courts are full of people who are, you know, uh, with uh, all kinds of problems because they didn't pay attention to signs. You see people walking their dogs and the dogs, you know, we're in an area where it says no dogs and, and, and they're doing their business on the pavement, the people are just walking along, you're supposed to pick it up, you're not even supposed to be in an area where it says no dogs, you know. Anyway, all these things, but signs, people pay no attention to signs. And of course, the major sign that I see in my life that people pay no attention to is the decline of morality in that Western society as well. Now, Western society um, has failed. You can, you can see that there are other faiths and other people out there in other places looking at Western society going, you know, you've gone too far, you've let too much in, you've got too much immorality, you've got too much of this, you've got too much of that, okay? But it was never meant to be that way. It's been undermined, okay? Our system, uh, democratic system worked very well up until these modern days, because now we've got an anything goes, a free will thing. Now, I'm an advocate for free will, 
don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not in, I, I have no time for Calvinistic things because they've lost the compassion of God for all people, okay? And it's just a discrimination of, of, of kinds. Um, but, you know, we, we need to uh, make sure that we try and, and keep society in some sort of order. But when people want to challenge it and challenge it and challenge it and disobey the signs, disobey the rules, what happens is we end up with this society where anarchy prevails in many places. Not just on the roads. I'm not just talking about roads or, or dogs in parks. I'm, I'm talking about in all things. I'm talking about justice. You know, we, we have a problem with, with, with justice in the Western world because... We, we have, uh, you know, youth who, who, who can't be uh, charged as adults, yet they do the things that adults do, and sometimes worse than the things that adults do, but we can't do it because the system's not been balanced properly, okay? And then we've got immorality, and we've got all kinds of things going on, divorce, breakdowns, and, and, and uh, look, people can't decide whether they're men or women. We've got all kinds of problems in our society. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. It's simple. The sign is simple. People moved away from God. They moved away from the rules that God had given them, the signs that God said, look out, these signs are going to... Obey these signs that I've given you in the Bible because you're going to be in trouble if you don't. And when Western society started taking God, the church, and, and the faith out of it, everything started to... Because there were no absolutes anymore. Signs mean nothing. The words mean nothing. People just do whatever they feel like doing. What a sad place. But there's hope. There's great hope because God is still on the throne. God still loves you. God still cares for you. You still matter to God. You're not just a piece of matter spinning around endlessly doing nothing. No, you're precious and you're loved by God. And there is a better way to live in this world and it's through God. I'm not saying you're going to solve every problem that's out there. Oh no, the devil's roaming around like a roaring lion. The Bible tells us that. But you can have a better life here on earth and you can have an eternal home in heaven through Jesus Christ. You don't have to partake in all this stuff where people don't want to obey anything anymore. That's going to lead you to a road of darkness. A life with Christ will lead you to walk in the light. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that we can see the signs as Christians. We can see the signs of the times. We can see the things that will be perilous times, Lord. But through you, Lord, we can overcome these things. Through you, we can have a, a, a peace that passes all understanding, even amongst all this turmoil and all these uh, problems here on earth, Lord, because you love us, because you care for us. We are your people. We're made in your image, Lord. And you have said to us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In the wonderful name of Christ, our risen Saviour. Amen. Now, I jotted down 10, very quickly in my mind, uh, signs that people don't obey. Um, uh, and that's speed signs, as we already discussed. The keep left pedestrian signs when you're on uh, stairs or whatever. People are in the middle and centre. They're not where they're meant to be. That was another one. A give way stop signs. We said that. People don't obey those. Um, uh, no feet on seats. And, on, on buses and trains and, and other places, people have got their feet on the seats. Don't obey the sign, okay? Uh, no swimming or diving, you know? I've got a few places around where I live where it says no swimming or diving. You get in there on a hot day and everyone's swimming and diving. We've had, we've had half a dozen people die in that spot in the last few years. Anyway, no dogs allowed. We already spoke about that. That's, that's, an, that's another one. It's number seven. Um, okay, no alcohol allowed. I see people drinking in areas where it says no alcohol allowed, especially at sporting grounds. Okay, no smoking or vaping. You, I, I see people doing that everywhere. Everywhere, even in the hospital. Around the hospital grounds where it says absolutely not. Okay? And I thought I'd put this one in there because I think it's needful. And that is, do not take the Lord's name in vain, which is one of the Ten Commandments. But you see, there are people walking around everywhere using the name of Jesus and the Lord as some sort of, uh, not exaltation, but as some sort of blaspheme or some sort of curse or some sort of word for shock. Dear, dear. Do you realize, people, that when you blaspheme the word of God and you use God's name in vain, he remembers, he knows. Don't do it. Definitely, definitely, definitely don't do it. 
Let's go to uh, the Ten Commandments and read that. Ten Commandments in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 is the one I'm referring to. It says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, you, you've probably seen that written on plaques in places. You know, you might see that written on a church somewhere or a Christian bookshop or even a cafe. Then I'll tell you, I've seen it there. But there's more to it. Let me read on. This is still verse 7, by the way. Thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless. Guiltless. Uh, yeah. Guiltless, my friends. Guiltless. Don't believe that he will not hold you guilty. It says he will not hold you guiltless. In other words, you will be accountable for when you use the Lord's name in vain. Probably don't read that bit. It probably says, just do not take the Lord's name in vain. Let me read it again. It says this, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless. But take it his name in vain. God says very, very, very clearly that his name is holy. His name is righteous. His name is to be worshipped. His name is above all names. Yet, we don't see the danger signs when God says, I'll hold you not guiltless. You might think, oh, no, I'm not guilty. I, I just didn't mean it. Now, God says, no, no, no. You stop, think about it, and don't use my name in vain. Let's look at some more verses. Just go over a few pages. Let's go to Leviticus and we'll go to chapter 19 and uh, verse 12. Again, God says exactly the same thing. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. God says, don't use my name in any other way. There's a sign here that I will, I will not hold you guiltless. You know? Now, as I said to you, the... Western society's demise is because we're not obeying the signs. We're not obeying the rules, okay? We're given free will in the Western society, but what we've done is we've abused the free will, okay? And when that happens, society fails. Marriages fail. Families fail. Lives fail. Because those sets of rules that we've got, that we put in place to have organized society, through God, through the faith, have been thrown out. Let's look at another verse. Staying in the Old Testament, come with me to the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 39, verse 7. It says, So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One, in Israel, again, God says, don't pollute my name. Don't use it in vain. God's given you the signs, the words, saying, don't use his name in vain. Why am I telling you this? Because God says you won't be guiltless. You can think, oh, well, I'm not guilty. But God says we are guilty. Okay? Not, it's not just about the, the, using God's name in vain. Okay? It's about all the signs and all the things I told you before. It's about respecting and accepting uh, a uniform law okay, that keeps society in some kind of order. And when people undermine those, once upon a time, we used to put those people away and, and charge them accordingly, and they would learn their lesson. But today, we don't do that. We give people so much free will, they undermine our values, especially our faith-based values, to the point where they even try to stamp out Christianity. They try to stamp out Christian morals. They try to stamp out Christian uh, peace and faith and love and life by calling it hate and all these other things. And the result of that is society, marriages, people all go downhill. Depression has never been greater in our world. Why? Because God has been thrown out. Anxiety has never been greater in our world. Why? Because God has been thrown out. Divorce has never been higher in our world because God has been thrown out. Abortion has never been higher in our world because God has been thrown out. Young people feel more hopeless than ever. Why? Because God has been thrown out. But I'm here to tell you that God loves you, God cares for you, God has prepared a special place for you in heaven and is waiting for you to come to him. 
You matter to God. You're special to God. He created you in his image. Let the world tell you there's no God. You're a piece of matter spinning around. Or you're an ape or you're a monkey or a pond scum or something else. And you're not loved and you're not needed and you're not wanted, which is the lies of the devil. Because God loves you. God cares for you. You do matter to him. He knows every hair on your head. He knows your name. And he knows you personally because he created you. Yet the world tells you it's hopeless and there's nothing. Who told you there's no God? Why did they tell you there's no God? And don't listen to them. Look for yourself. That's what I did. Look for yourself. Let's read on. Turn with me um, to the New Testament, the book of Acts. We go to chapter 5 and we find the apostles being thrown into prison here um, for preaching the word of God, which happens to people today in some places. And it says here, it says in verse 28, after God had opened the prisons and let them out and commanded them to go and teach, it says this, and this is the, the officers uh, who put them in jail, had no idea how they got out. It says this, saying, did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in his name, that's the name of the Lord, Jesus, and have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, guess what? The blood is upon you because you did hang him on a tree and you did put him on a cross and you did crucify the Lord. But that was going to happen because he had to do that for our sins. But anyway, what I'm getting at here, and I'll read on and you'll understand what I'm saying, okay, is that they were told not to do something that was contrary to the word of God, okay? And they were put in jail for it. God opened the jails and said, just go out and keep doing it. And they did. And then they were told. Now they're found, and, and the officers are saying this. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he hanged on a tree. Hmm. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince, a saviour, for, uh, for to give repentance to Israel for forgiveness of sins. And we're witness of these things. And so also the Holy Ghost, whom God had given to them, but obey him. Okay? When men tell you that there's no God, when men tell you that there's no hope, when men tell you that evolution is true and it's not, when men tell you that you, you're just a piece of matter spinning around, you don't have to listen. When people tell you, well, you don't have to obey the laws, you don't have to obey God, you don't have to be moral, you don't have to uh, 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 care for people, you don't have to do this, you can do anything you want, okay? God says, no, that's not what I offered you in order to have a peaceful life. I've given you the signs, I've given you the words, I've given you Christ. I've told you the way to have a better life. Like I said to you earlier on, when people tell you that there's nothing, come and read it for yourself. Here, here, God has said to these men, go, open the jail doors and said, go out and preach. Because it was still, the gospel was still young then. So they went off and they preached again. And the captain to the guards came along and said, hey, we don't even know how you got out of jail, but we locked all the doors, but now you're out. And now you're out here preaching again. And they said, because we're not going to obey man, because we've got a greater commandment here. Okay, we're not, we're not going to do what man says. Now, I'm not telling you to disobey laws. I'm not telling you to disobey authority. I'm not telling you that. Okay, don't, don't quote me and say, oh, you told me to disobey. No, I'm saying you respect the law because many, many, many laws are put in place to protect us. Okay. That's what they're there for. The many uh, laws in, in our uh, um, democratic Western world were based upon the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not covet. You know, and what are the steal things. You know, they, they, they were there for us to understand. All of thy father and thy mother. What happened to that one? Gone. Gone. You know, because they go, oh, well, you know, he upset me or I didn't like the rules or something. Well, hey, you know what? Sometimes, not all the time, parents are putting rules in place to protect children. You know, don't cross the road, you know, without looking. <sighs> oh my, you know, but today, oh my, oh my. You know, pa parents, the authority that parents have over their children has been taken away. You know, we, in, in this Western world, we have children deciding before they're even at the age of understanding what sexuality is. How is that possible? Because our laws have been watered down. Because we've taken away faith-based things. We've taken God out of it. Because they, they, they teach evolution as absolute fact. 
And it's not. It, it's pseudoscience, people, when they do that. Every time that they put, and I just read it on a bus stop recently, or 20 million years ago, they should have a big asterisk on it saying, theory only. But they lie to you. And they tell you it's a fact, but it's not reproducible, it's not testable, it's not provable, so it is not true science. But it's everywhere. It's in the universities, the colleges, the schools, the workplace, and they lie to you because they tell you it's the truth. But it's not provable. It's not provable. No. So it's a theory. Yeah. I'm trying to bring today hope, vision, Love, life, Christ, a better life here on earth for you. And tell you how much you really matter to God. A few more verses in closing. Turn with me uh, a few pages over now to book of 1 John, towards the end of the New Testament. Chapter 5 we're going to read from. I love this. It's beautiful, beautiful words. And this sums up everything that I'm trying to say today um, about warning signs and what God has given to us. Okay, Chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him begat loveth him also, that he is begotten of him. So, loving God, Christ is fundamentally the first thing. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love and keep his commandments. When we keep God's commandments, believe it or not, that's the happiest place on earth. Yeah, just to try and not to be sinless. You can't do that. <laughs> You're a sinner born on earth, but through Christ your sins are forgiven. But you just want to do your best. You want to do your best. You'll never please everybody if you just do your best. Uh, verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Do you hear that? Commandments are not grievous. You know, when I go out and talk to people, they say, oh, there's too many rules and regulations. What? What? Don't steal? Don't kill? <laughs> Love others? Love your neighbour? Oh, which is so hard? <laughs> I don't think they are. It's just that you want to make them hard. Can we all keep the Ten Commandments? Absolutely not. No, no, but we can't. But we do our best. Okay? Verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. That's what I said to you. You overcome of the world. You live in the world, but you overcome. Right? And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now, I'm going to close with this today, because this is really important. For there are three that bear the record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and the three are one. There are other Bibles out there that say the three agree, and the three this, and the three that. And the Bible says... And it's translated from the Texas Receptors, from the Greek, from the Hebrew, the Aramaic. The three are just one. That's the Godhead. That's the Trinity. Okay? When you come to Christ, you start to understand. And I've spoken to a lot of people over the years who cannot understand that um, three can still be one. Well, you know, your body's three parts, but you're still only one being, you know? <laughs> it's a, what are the three parts? Well, there's a flesh, there's a spirit, there's a soul. There's water, there's blood, and there's other parts of you. You can be three parts at a one, absolutely. Three parts of a car, engine, a chassis, <laughs> and a body. Still only one car, you take one part away, your car don't work properly. <laughs> three can easily be one, if you want to understand it. There are some who want to deny it, but Jesus has said, you know, the Father and I are one. The Holy Spirit, I live with you. It's one. It's one Godhead. And that Godhead is special. That Godhead needs to be respected. Certainly never, ever blaspheme. And while we're on the subject of blaspheme, you know, don't blaspheme other faiths. Really, that's, that's not going to help anybody. Love them, help them. Don't 
put them down. God says, love your neighbour. He didn't say, I only love them if they're Christians. He didn't say that. A greater life is available for you, available for me, available for everybody who wants to trust the Lord because he has promised that. He's promised you a peace that passes all understanding. He loves you, cares for you, special, has great compassion for you, wants you back in his presence through Christ. And if you've never trusted Christ, I beg you today, do that. Because you're not guaranteed a tomorrow. And you can live in a world where people want to disobey signs and disobey the word of God and take his name in vain, but you'll still have peace because the Lord says, I'll give you my peace. And what a blessing it is to have that. Lord bless. Bye for now. Death. It can strike without a moment's notice. A young person, full of life in the morning, can be gone forever by the end of the workday. A father takes his last breath as his heart gives way unexpectedly. A mother dies during a routine operation. A sister with cancer. A brother in a car wreck. A fall. Old age. War. Death is a relentless foe. It hunts us until it has each one of us in its grasp. Our cemeteries testify to the fact that our battle with death is a losing one. Death always wins. Death is coming for you. Are you ready to go wherever death takes you? Some believe that nothing happens after we die. We just cease to exist. Others believe that there is a heaven and that all but the really bad go there. Still others believe that there is a God who will judge man according to his works and allow the good into heaven and send the bad to hell. Are any of these views correct? How can we know? Where can we turn for answers? Nearly a third of all the people living on earth today say they are Christians. That means that they take the Bible as their holy book and consider its writing sacred. But even many Christians are not fully aware of what the Bible teaches on this most important subject, death. Why should we consider the Bible's point of view? There are a few things that commend the Bible. First, virtually every prophecy written in the Bible has already been fulfilled. This is in stark contrast with other religious writings which contain no fulfilled prophecy. The Bible tells of events that would befall Israel as a nation. It tells us that in the last days, every man would be numbered before being allowed to buy or sell. Far-fetched? Not anymore. For what other reason should we consider the Bible's point of view? The Bible has its roots all the way back to the earliest recorded history of man. It takes its place with the earliest recorded writings and this book has given comfort to billions in every age. This book has life-transforming power. People have died for the words and the message in this book. Finally, and most importantly, we believe this book when it claims to be the very words of God. So what does the Bible have to say about death? Does it have any answers about this dark and mysterious subject which casts a pall over all men? Yes, one of the major themes of Scripture is the subject of death. We find death in the first chapters of Genesis and in the final chapters of Revelation. The Bible has good news and bad news about death. Let's consider the bad news first. The Bible says that death is not natural. God did not intend for man to die. Death is a curse on man for his rebellion against God. God gave man the world in a perfect state, but man rebelled against God. If we take the Ten Commandments as a basic outline for God's standard of righteousness, we quickly find that each of us is guilty of breaking some or most of these commandments. Prohibitions on stealing and killing are in there, but so is lying, dishonoring our parents, making idols, adultery, and failing to worship the only true God. 
Many people believe that there are big sins and small sins, and that as long as you haven't killed anyone, you'll probably go to heaven. Unfortunately, that is not what the Bible teaches. Ezekiel 18.20 The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. The bad news about death is that it is a result of sin, but it gets worse. Man dies physically because of sin, but there is a coming judgment because of sin in which man will be sentenced to spiritual death in a place the Bible calls the lake of fire. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Do you believe that? The death that we see all around us in this wicked world is not the end, but it certainly testifies to the fact that God must mean what He says. God has promised eternal torment for sinners. Based on what we've seen so far, do you believe that you are a sinner? Instead of giving yourself the benefit of the doubt, why don't you truly scrutinize yourself? and ask yourself if you could be in danger of God's coming judgment. Only when you stand in doubt of yourself and seek to find a remedy to your sinful condition will this next part make any sense to you. And that is the subject of this video. The meaning of the term gospel. The Greek word gospel means good news, and having considered the sobering subject of death, we need some good news. The good news is that God loves man. He loves men, women, and children so much that He Himself took the penalty of your sin and mine. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. You and I are sinners, but Jesus never sinned. Even His enemies could find no fault with Him. Because He was perfect, his death was undeserved. It was a substitutionary sacrifice. He died in your place. He died the death that we should have died. Men naturally believe in substitutionary sacrifices. In the most uncivilized places, we find men offering the blood of animals to appease their gods. They believe that something or someone else can die in their stead. But the news gets better. Jesus died, was put in a grave for three days, and rose again. After His resurrection, He was seen by multitudes of people who testified to the fact that He was alive after death. The Apostle Paul testified to that fact this way, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, or Peter, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that He was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Do you believe that? Friend, let me ask you something. Are you tired of your sin? Have you ever wanted to be clean from the evil things you've done? Does death and what lies beyond frighten you? You can have peace with God today because Jesus Christ died in your place. That is the meaning of the term gospel. The good news is that Jesus Christ offers pardon to sinners. He can blot out every transgression and desires to do so. He can give you a new start on life. Throw yourself on God's mercy. Openly confess your sin to God. Plead His forgiveness on the basis of what Jesus Christ did for you. John 6.28
Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent.